amazing, amazing woman. I'm going to explain this to you because uh, you got to hear her story. When I first found out about Leilani, I was blown away. Blown away because Leilani is one of those people when you find out what she does, I don't know how she stuffed this into a 24 hour day. I really don't. Like, you know what I'm talking about. Because I, I just don't, I, I seriously don't know how you do this. So, Leilani, if you don't know who Leilani Munzer is, is a biology graduate, race car driver, and environmental activist. Discovery's Pen and Green named her the number one eco athlete in the world. Elle Magazine awarded her their Genius Award, and Sports Illustrated named her one of the top 10 female race car drivers in the world. You're my number one. Uh, since 2007, Leilani has been adopting endangered rainforests to offset the carbon footprint of a race car. So far, she has protected over 1,500 acres of rainforest. Leilani sits on the board of EarthX Film, Empowered by Light, and the Oceanic Preservation Society, the Academy Award-winning filmmakers behind The Cove. She is featured in their 2015 Emmy-nominated documentary, Racing Extinction. Leilani is also a patron of Population Matters and an ambassador of Rickleberry's Dolphin Project. Leilani is vegan. Her personal car is an electric Tesla Model S, which she charges with solar power. And Leilani's motto is never underestimate a vegan hippie chick with a race car. Give it up for Leilani. Hunter. First of all, I just want to say it's an honor to be here to talk to you guys at Charlotte VegFest. I speak all over at VegFest all over the place, but this is the first time that I have my race car. So if you've seen the bright green number 20 vegan strong race car right there, um, that is the car that I will be racing at Kansas Speedway um, next Friday. If you're interested in watching the race and cheering for the only vegan themed race car in the world, the race is live on Fox Sports. So I know a lot of you may have wondered, thank you. <laughs> I know a lot of you may have wondered like how in the world can a race car driver also be an environmental activist? I know those two things don't normally go together, but before I was a race car driver, I was a biology graduate from the University of California in San Diego. And I'm really just your typical composting, rainwater collecting, electric car and solar panel owning vegan hippie chick. I just happen to drive race cars once in a while. ESPN Magazine once called me the oxymoron, a tree-hugging race car driver. I'm an uncommon messenger in the environmental world and the vegan world, I know that. Um, but I came across a quote by a man named Earl Bakken that helped make some sense of it for me. Earl Bakken said, by all reckoning, bumblebees are aerodynamically unsound and should not be able to fly. Yet the little bee gets those wings going like a turbojet and flies to every plant its chubby little body can land on. Bumblebees are the most persistent creatures. They don't know they can't fly, and so they just keep buzzing around. Much like the chubby bumblebee, I am a race car driver that doesn't know that I'm not allowed to be an environmental activist, and so I just keep buzzing around. I'm definitely an activist more than a driver. Um, I've been to Washington, D.C. to lobby for clean energy. I've had to lobby for electric cars right here in my state when they were trying to uh, make it impossible for Tesla to sell cars in our state. I traveled twice to the BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, and I've traveled four times to Taiji, Japan, which is the horrific place where they slaughter the dolphins that you may have seen in the Academy Award-winning film, The Cove. How many people here have seen The Cove? Can I just get a raise of hands? Okay, pretty good, a little bit less than half. Um, just for those of you who have not watched The Cove, uh, the Cove is the most winning documentary of all time. It's the first documentary in history to sweep all of the Guild Awards. I know a lot of people are scared to see it because they think they're going to see dolphins getting hurt. Uh, but that part of the film is actually less than three minutes of the film. So I encourage you to watch it anyways because it's a fantastic film. I've been driving race cars promoting all different kinds of causes that I care about. Everything from a future to 100% renewable energy, solar power, wind power, LED lighting, 
Um, I've had two documentary films on my car. The first one was The Cove, um, which I crowdfunded to get that car on the track at Daytona. And the second film was Blackfish. How many people here have seen Blackfish? Okay. So actually, that's so strange. Less people have seen Blackfish than The Cove. Um, the Blackfish is a CNN documentary about orca captivity. For the past two years, I've been driving a vegan-themed race car, which is the first race car in the world that's ever had a vegan theme to it. And this year, we've been giving away free vegan cheeseburgers at the racetrack, and it has been an amazing experience. We've actually given away 30,000 vegan cheeseburgers to NASCAR fans over just five races. Um, so I'm gonna show you a video from Daytona this year. My name is Leilani Munter, and I am a vegan race car driver and an activist. I'm here in the Vegan Strong Tent. We're talking about the vegan lifestyle here at Daytona. Daytona! <laughs> We've got a couple of bodybuilders here. It's really important to show people that there are big, strong men with huge muscles that are vegan. Does he look like he's suffering from protein deficiency? Just look. People think you have to drink milk, you have to have to eat meat uh, in order to get the, uh, the balanced diet, and you don't. I'm a vegan, yep. Since the beginning of the year, lose weight, you know, I feel great. I've made a lifestyle decision 20 years ago. I've kept about 120 pounds off. I have a bad stomach, and I noticed with vegan, I feel so much better. I went completely vegan. A clean sweep. I have energy, and I don't ever feel bloated after I eat. It's just, I just feel better. Let everybody know that you can look like this when you get 55 you cut that meat down. I think we're surprising quite a few people that think that vegans just eat quinoa and kale and, like, really healthy rabbit food. Burgers are up! Hot off the griddle, just for you. Oh and we are giving away what is called the Impossible Burger, which is an amazing plant-based burger that tastes really, really meaty. It has zero cholesterol. I feel like it's a real burger. Yeah, it tastes like a meaty burger. Do you have another one? <laughs> Come on, Dad, try it, try it. You have like a hot dog somewhere. Lots of sandwiches. Sometimes it's hard to get people to take that first bite. I'd rather get a lobotomy, to be with you. But I'm persistent with those kinds of people. As soon as they take that bite, and they taste it, and they go. Those reactions are priceless. If it all tastes like this, I'd be vegan today. <laughs> that opens a little door. I think the human race is evolving to be more conscious of their choices that they make, whether it's what they buy or what they drive or what they eat. There are no real healthy choices at, at races, and there needs to be for people like, like me who are diabetic. I had two heart attacks. Cut out meat, eating veggies. I lost 138 pounds. So now I feel good. I feel good. I feel energy, man. I mean, face it, we're the meat and potato sport. I mean, we're just, you know, and with some cheese on the side. So I think bringing it into the midway, bringing it to the racetrack, I think that it can fit into the NASCAR culture and the, and the culture as a whole. Food is essentially fuel. I wouldn't put bad fuel, dirty fuel in my race car, just like I wouldn't put dirty fuel in my body. Go vegan. doing surveys at the uh, track of all the people that came through our tent and um, we actually found that six percent of the people that came through our tent were already vegan before they even walked into my tent. Eleven percent of them were already vegetarian and that's actually reflective of the general population. When they survey the general population that's what the numbers for the United States are showing. Six percent, eleven percent, 6% is huge because actually just three years ago it was only 1%. So we are multiplying and multiplying pretty quickly. So I'm going to show you some other clips. In 2012 I began working with the people that made the code that I talked about earlier on another film that's called Racing Extinction. It's about the sixth mass extinction of species. And scientists predict that the human footprint on our planet is actually going to cause 50% of all the species on Earth to vanish by the end of this century. 
There have been five major mass extinction events on the planet, and we are currently living through the sixth mass extinction. So they, they called this era the Anthropocene. That translates to the age of man. It is where the human impact on our planet is so great that we are actually changing the fossil record of our future. The last mass extinction event that happened was 65 million years ago, and that was the event that took out the dinosaurs. Um, it is widely believed that that happened because of a collision with an asteroid, and today we have absolutely no trouble figuring out what is causing this sixth mass extinction, and it is us. Humans are the cause, and we are the only ones who can do anything to stop this change. And so I'm going to show you right now a trailer for racing extinction. What's happening now is unprecedented in Earth's history. Why would we want to disrupt something that took billions of years to evolve. We need to fight it on all fronts. I think it's dawning on us now that this is the big one. OPS is a group I formed. It uses covert operations to expose harmed and endangered species. We're doing an order here. One bottle cam. Right there's the lens. Two buttonhole cameras. Check one, two. Oh, that's good. Just about everything endangered in the world is for sale in China. Look at this stuff. Endangered, highly endangered, highly endangered. The more illegal it is, the more you have to go to the back rooms. We're definitely not welcome here. Oh my gosh! There's things going on that are probably not safe to talk about. Climate is controlled by the ocean. And we're dumping so much carbon in the oceans, it can't take it anymore. Oh. <laughs> We found this guy, Mr. Lee. He's culling and processing whale sharks. Nobody had ever gotten a camera in there before. We run into people with badges and uniforms. Oh Strip God. off yeah. all this stuff. Throw it over a wall. Did you say the boss king shot oil? Jesus. This world is absolutely insane. Wildlife trade is second only to the drug market in the world. It's that lucrative. We need a getaway driver. And I knew one of the best. I love it. To create a heist, to hijack the world's attention. I think we want to put in an order for a car today. <laughs> Excellent, we'll take one. Blow the lid off this place, right? There's been five major extinctions in the history of the planet. This may be the sixth. When you're talking about losing all of nature, it's not a spectator sport anymore. Everybody has to become active somehow. The idea is to inspire people. Imagery is very powerful. If you can reach people, you can change them. We can make this happen. We need people to understand it's worth doing. People that have been in the business that don't even bother. But better to light one candle than curse the darkness. There's so many people who sit back and say we're screwed. But you know what? That one candle, maybe someone else with a candle will find you. And I think that's where movements are started. to take a deep breath right now. Now take a second deep breath. One of those two breaths, the oxygen came from our oceans, from phytoplankton blooms that happen in our oceans. So I know everybody thinks of rainforests, right? Myself included. In 2007, when I just started to start do the rainforest program to offset the carbon footprint in the car, I automatically chose rainforests because I considered that to be sort of the lungs of our planet. And while they are part of the lungs, another big lung is in our oceans. And so the health of our oceans and the health of, of everything on this planet is really dependent on some of the smallest creatures on the planet, and that's phytoplankton. And ever since the Industrial Re Revolution, since we started putting fossil fuels and greenhouse gases into our atmosphere, our ocean has acted as a carbon sink. So about 30% of the carbon that goes into the atmosphere is then absorbed by our ocean. That's making the ocean more acidic. It's changing the pH. And that's why our coral reefs are bleaching. So the goal of the Oceanic Preservation Society, the group that made Racing Extinction, is to use film and media to inspire people to care. Humans are very visual creatures. Um, so one of the things that we did is we went to New York City and I took a really cool Tesla that you'll see me driving in the film. 
and we projected some imagery onto the side of the United Nations building, and this was at the climate summit. So I'm gonna show you a clip of that. years, people will look back on this particular period and say to themselves, how did those people at that time just allow all these amazing creatures to vanish? But it would be very little use in me or anybody else exerting all this energy to save the wild places if people are not being educated into being better stewards than we've been. If we all lose hope, there is no hope. Without hope, people fall into apathy. There's still a lot left that's worth fighting for. that are trying to do their best to make a difference, right? You're, you're trying to lessen your impact on the planet by eating plants instead of animals. Um, but we are certainly the most dangerous species on Earth. Humans actually represent just 0.01% of all the life on the planet. And yet, in just the short time that we've been here, we have had a catastrophic effect on the natural world. Does anybody want to take a guess as to how many, what percentage of the wild animals have we already pushed off this planet since we got here? 83%. We have already destroyed 83% of all the wild mammals on the planet, and half of the 
plants. And right now, one third of the arable land that's on our planet is being used to grow grain that is then fed to livestock. It's such an incredibly inefficient way of feeding people, not to mention how horrible it is for the animals, but it is a really inefficient way to get nutrients. Um, so right now, 60% of all the animals that are on this planet are, guess what? Livestock. Livestock makes up 60% of all the animals on the planet. The other 36% are humans, and that leaves just 4% left that are wild mammals. Farmed poultry makes up 70% of all the birds on our planet, with just 30% of them being wild. And think about how sad that is, right? That means that 70% of the birds on this planet cannot fly. Like that's what wings are for. Um, so we are losing so much so fast, and I'm going to let a wonderful man by the name of Christopher Clark from Cornell University's Bioacoustical Laboratory show you with sound the instruments in nature that we are losing. The whole world is singing. Clicking and grinding and whistling and thumping but we've stopped listening. The Cornell Bioacoustical Laboratory has the largest repository of animal sounds on the planet. They've been collecting them since the 1930s. So there's this range of sounds from the largest animal ever to live on this planet to the tiniest little insects. This is a song recording of a male oo -oh singing on Kauai. These birds are made for life, so he would be singing a duet with his mate where he sings and then she sings back and forth. Here comes the male song. There's no response. Here's the male song again. That's the last male of a species singing for a female who will never come. He is totally alone. And now his voice is gone. So every single issue that we're facing, climate change, ocean acidification, habitat destruction, pollution, species extinction, all of these things are being amplified as the human population continues to grow. It took humans nearly 200,000 years to reach a population of 1 billion. We hit that mark in 1804. It then took just 126 years for us to double that to 2 billion. And then only 30 years to reach 3 billion. Then we hit 14 years, and in 1974, the year that I was born, we hit a population of 4 billion people. So in just my 44-year lifetime, we have nearly doubled the population on the planet. We are currently at 7.6 billion people on the planet with a growth rate of approximately 1 billion people every 12 years. For every billion people that are added to the planet, with the current rate of meat consumption, that adds 10 billion more animals. It's not a sustainable math equation, right? Like, you don't have to be a rocket science to figure out that we cannot keep adding a billion people to the planet every 12 years and 10 billion more animals. We do not have the resources to do that. Um, so obviously, a lot of the impact is coming from humans' desire to eat meat and dairy products. And I know a lot of people associate their carbon footprint with their cars and how much they fly. And you know, that's why I have a Tesla and I power it with solar. But actually, what you eat and what you put on your plate is a much bigger effect on the environment. But do both if you can. Drive electric and go vegan. <laughs> It sounds a bit silly, change your diet and save the planet, but if humans could become vegetarians now, you would make a massive difference. By far and away, the biggest factor in terms of this mass extinction 
is destroying natural habitat or converting natural habitat into land for food. The more dependent we are on meat, milk, and eggs, the greater the CO2 and methane emissions. Cattle and ruminants of all kinds produce methane as a byproduct of breaking down grass and other things that they feed on. So the contractions are pushing this gas out from the stomach going through here in the one-way valve. Yes, and after the this, we collect inside the bag. So how long has that bag been collecting gas? For? Only two hours. Methane is something like 22 times more potent as a climate changing gas than is CO2. So it doesn't take very much methane to make a difference. A cow can basically fill up a 55 gallon garbage bag full of methane every day. One cow is not a problem, but now we have 1.5 billion of them. And it's an incredibly inefficient way of producing food. Three quarters of agricultural land is used just to feed livestock. When you factor in everything, the clearing of the land for grazing, feeding, transporting, livestock causes more greenhouse gases than all the direct emissions from the entire transportation sector. So you can see from that clip that by not eating meat, you guys are making an incredible positive um, move for your carbon footprint on this planet. In a year-long study that was done by researchers at Cornell University, ecologists wanted to figure out what is the ideal number of people that the Earth can hold comfortably. And that assumes that everybody is living in relative prosperity with access to clean water and electricity. And what they found was that number was two billion. So we have already overshot the runway by 5.6 billion people. Um, while it's the natural instinct for humans to breed and reproduce, perhaps humans need to consider that one of the solutions to all of these problems that we're facing on the planet is actually to not do so, to not reproduce. This is an incredibly huge problem and this is a problem that a lot of people don't want to talk about because it's an uncomfortable conversation to have, but I honestly think it's the most important conversation we can have. Um, because even though there's lots more people going vegan and driving electric cars and putting up solar panels, that's great, but that is not overriding the number of people that we are adding to the planet. So please, please consider that. Back when I was a student at the University of California, I was actually in a biochemistry class, and I went in and the professor said, everybody close your books. I'm not gonna talk about biochemistry today, I'm gonna show you guys a film. And it was a short film about human population. And I remember just being devastated by it. That was about 25 years ago. And, um, but the message stuck with me. I carried that with me forever. And my husband and I got married in 2009 and we are child free by choice for these reasons. And I want people to feel more comfortable having this conversation because I understand it's uncomfortable. The only way we're gonna make it more comfortable is if we start talking about it and start addressing the issue. Um, and I think both parents and non-parents should be able to have this discussion because it affects all of us. For people who really, really can't deny their, their need to be mothers and fathers, which I totally understand, um, there are over 153 million orphan children that are already here on the planet that could really use a home. So just another thing to consider. You will probably find, as I have, that the more that you learn about all these issues that we're facing, the more that you will become aware, not only of your impact, but of the impact of everyone around you. And I think that this is both a blessing and a curse. But with that burden of knowing comes a responsibility. And that responsibility to, is to educate the people around you whose eyes have not yet opened. Charles Darwin once said, it is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor is it the most intelligent. It is the one that is most adaptable to change. And so in the spirit of Charles Darwin, I think it's time for humans to utilize our intelligence to adapt and to change the way that we are living on this planet. This generation in particular 
has been called upon to answer really the most noble of duties, and that is to ensure the survival of future generations with the most basic of survival mechanisms, adaptation. And really the future of life on this planet depends on all of us acting and all of us becoming a part of the solution. One of my favorite parts of Racing Extinction is when a very famous wildlife photographer named Joel Sart Sartori explains why, despite all of these incredible challenges that we are facing right now, why right now today is one of the best times to be on our planet if you want to save species. OPS started out as a way to document endangered species. There's all these creatures that are just on the brink. And you can throw up your hands very easily and say, well, it's too big of an issue. But you know what? There's a few people doing great things. You know, Joel Sartori's work is some of the most fabulous work I've ever seen. Can we lift his chin up a little bit for me, please? Perfect. PhotoArk's my 20-year attempt to photograph every captive species on Earth to get the public to care and save them while there's still time to do so. And a lot of times these pictures I do are the only national coverage these animals will ever get before they go extinct. This is it. This is their one chance. This is the very last dusky seaside sparrow, last wild-caught bird. There's another sparrow just down the road, the Florida grasshopper sparrow, that's very near extinction. You hear something? That's a grasshopper sparrow. 91% of this prairie habitat is gone. Mm -hmm. We're at roughly around 20 sparrows a year. 20? 20. From 150 to 20. So it's getting harder every year to find the bird, huh? I really hope these pictures I do aren't just some sort of an archive of the things we lost, but instead it's a chance to get people interested, get them to look these animals in the eye, and fall in love with them. The pictures of the sparrow ended up on the cover of Audubon. When the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service saw that, they went from allocating twenty dollars or $30,000 a year to about $1.3 million to try to turn things around for this bird. There's never been a better time to be alive if you want to save species, because there's so many on the ropes. It's an excellent time to be alive, because I can, we all can change things right now. Here he goes. I just love that take on it, because I think being an activist and being somebody who cares can be painful a lot of the time. Because there is so many bad things happening to animals, and you want to do so many things to help, and you can kind of feel hopeless. And I love that he looks at it like, this is the best time to be alive because there's so many species that are on the brink that you have the opportunity to try and save. And so every time I get depressed about all these issues, I try and remember those words. So my name is Leilani Munter, and I am a woman. I am a race car driver and a biologist. I am an environmental activist and a wife. I am a friend, a daughter, a sister, and a scuba diver. And while I do each of these things to the betterment of myself, on my very best days, I am a catalyst for change outside of myself. And that is the core reason why I am here. I pledge to each of you here today to use my voice to encourage change and adaptation as much as I can. I must warn you that as a woman in racing, the odds are stacked against me. If you listen to statistics, they will tell you that as a woman, I am actually more likely to be sent into space than I am to ever race on the top level of NASCAR. But like the chubby bumblebee that doesn't know it can't fly, I just keep buzzing around. On my long strange journey, I have met other bumblebees buzzing around and making a difference. One of them was a wonderful lady named Wangari Matai. She was the first African woman in Central or Eastern Africa to earn her PhD. Her husband divorced her in 1977 and was quoted as saying, she was too educated, too strong, too successful, too stubborn, and too hard to control which is why I think she was absolutely fantastic. 
It was around the time of her divorce that Wangari started a small organization called the Green Belt Movement out of her small home. Since then, she and over 100,000 women who have volunteered for her organization have planted over 51 million trees in Africa in response to the environmental crisis there. When someone from the Clinton administration came to visit her, her home was so crowded with volunteers she had nowhere to offer him to sit. And in 2004, when she received the phone call that she had become a winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, becoming the very first environmentalist to do so, she put her phone down, went outside her house, and she planted a tree. Wangari planted a tree anytime she had something to celebrate in her life. Wangari once said, it's the little things that citizens do. That's what will make the difference. My little thing is planting trees. And so I hope that each of you today, if you haven't already, will go out and find your one thing. Just pick one thing, whatever it is that you have a passion for, find it, nurture it, be a bumblebee with me, and together we can change the world. Thank you. Thank you. One more hand, round of applause for the young By the way, her race bar is right here. Take a picture. Oh, oh yeah. The only, isn't that the only vegan bread? Is it, is it vegan? Yeah, race yeah. Bar? So this is the first ever vegan themed race car in the world, and I'm running my last race in it uh, next Friday at Kansas Speedway. The race will be live on Fox Sports 1. And I'm proud to say that we actually have die-cast race cars. It's the first vegan race car die-cast that's ever been made. So there's little kids out there playing with vegan race cars instead of the Burger King and the McDonald's and the Smithfield vegan car. <laughs> So stop by and you can get one, and I'm giving away free driver cards that I'll autograph, and we can take pictures of the car, we'll be here until it closes. And the website? Oh, and the website is just veganstrong.com. Go to veganstrong.com.